Thank you everyone for coming out. You know, this is a, you know, the hardy souls, the stalwart, you know, Syria advocates are here. Um, so thank you, thank you for embracing the weather. Um, this is the, the final part of our Syria series. My name is Dipinder Mayo. I am the Director of Education Outreach at the University of Minnesota Law School Center for New Americans. I know it's a mouthful. Um, the other co-sponsors in this series have been the Human Rights Center of the, of the law school as well as a human rights program of the uh, University of Minnesota undergraduate program. Um, and, you know, we put together this series because we wanted to bring light to uh, the conflict and the crisis uh, in Syria and bring some more visibility to those issues here on campus. Um, the first event we had was in February, and we had uh, Ambassador Stephen Rapp, who was the former at-large ambassador for global criminal justice, come and he spoke about justice and accountability in international law for mass atrocities in Syria. In October, we had Kevin Hardigan come speak, um, who he spoke about the refugee uh, crisis. He is a regional director uh, for Europe, Middle East, and Central Asia for Catholic uh, Relief Services. Um, and uh, today we have Fadia Fashi and Jay Abdo. Uh, and this crisis is defining. It's defining in many ways. Um, it's defining for the Middle East it's defining for refugee policy globally, and it's certainly defining for U.S. domestic policy and international policy. Um, and Fadia and Jay are here to speak about the targeting of artists and expression under the Syria regime. Um, and I'd like to tell you a little bit about them um, and their background before we get started. So Fadia describes herself not only as a visual artist, but as a women's rights activist. She graduated from the Ismail Institute of Art in 2000, um, and she also pursued a degree in criminal law at the University of Damascus and graduated in 2003. She also got a master's degree from the Syrian French Institute for Public Administration. She has used her degrees and her artistic skills to engage in causes advocating for women's rights and has created many exhibitions about women's issues. She wrote and produced a film, a short film called Suspended in 2011 about women exposing how the laws of rape in the Arab world leave women unprotected and disenfranchised. At the rise of the Arab Spring in the Middle East, she left Damascus for the United States to pursue a fellowship at the Humphrey School of Public Affairs here at the University of Minnesota, which she completed in May 2012. Art has become part of her activism to advocate for human rights. She got an award, the Gary Day Kramer Leadership Prize in Minneapolis, um, and she is now based in Los Angeles with her husband, Jay Abdo, who was a Syrian-American actor uh, who was born in Damascus in 1962. Um, he was awarded a scholarship to study civil engineering in Romania. Um, and while they began acting on the Romanian stage, uh, he made a remarkable impression upon theater critics and positive reviews followed. He returned to Syria to study acting at the prestigious Higher Institute of Dramatic Arts. And in the year after his graduation, he was named one of the most promising actors in Syria and the Arab world. <clears throat> to date, he has appeared in more than 40 Syrian films and over 1,000 episodes of television, most often in the leading role. He is also a grassroots activist, who has long used his fame to assist orphans, children with special needs, and children stricken with cancer. In 2011, his refusal to publicly support the repressive Assad regime led to personal threats and pressure, which ultimately left him with no option but to come to the United States to join his wife. Upon completing her coursework, Jay and she moved to Los Angeles where he rebuilt his acting career um, and has had major roles um, in uh, several films, Werner uh, Herzog's Queen of the Desert, um, in a film with Tom Hanks, A Hologram for King, and played a lead role in Bon Voyage, a successful movie that was shortlisted for the Oscars in 2017. <clears throat> so I'd like to thank you both for joining us today. Um, on a personal note, I would also like to thank you for being so open uh, to share your story. Uh, I myself come from a family that was forced to leave their home country and could never return home. Um, in 1947, India was partitioned um, to the secular country of India, and on the country of Pakistan. And my father, when he was eight, uh, he left his family, left with his family um, what is now Pakistan, and went to the city of Amritsar for what was supposed to be a short visit. 
Um, and uh, sure enough, communal violence ripped through the region, along through all the cities along the border, um, and they could never return. And during that time, about 700,000 people were killed in six months as Muslims fled India and Hindus and Sikhs fled Pakistan. And, um, you know, I have some details, but not many. My family was very close. Um, and uh, I do know that when they settled in Amritsar, the government did tell them they were looking for refugee prices to take uh, for where to live. They said, well, I'll take a, take a home uh, from the Muslim quarter. There's nobody left. Um, and that's what they did. They found a small home um, in the Muslim quarter. And when they entered um, and they went into the kitchen, they found um, food laid out and burnt chapatis on the pan. Uh, that previous family had fled in such a rush that they left food on the table. And it's little images like those, those little wispy details that I have, and I just, it's practically impossible for some people to process these atrocities, to speak about these atrocities. Um, so I want to say thank you. It's vitally important, it's inspiring, um, and it really is essential to understand how we can overcome this. Please help me welcome you. Thank you. Jay Five. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for this fantastic, wonderful introduction. I can't thank you enough because you have a, a series about Syria that does mean a lot for the Syrian people. After all these years, the Syrian people felt abandoned, felt alone, and to find people that are still interested in something considered, according to the media standard, all news. Thank you for uh, creating and doing this. Thank you for inviting us. Do you want to start telling us a story how your, wi your life was uh, in Damascus before the war? Uh, I, after graduating the uh, acting school, I started working as an actor in TV, uh, theater, and some short, I, I mean, movies for TV. Um, and it was good. Um, I started making a good living. Uh, I lived well. Um, I was extremely busy. Um, considered one of the uh, vanguardia elite in the Syrian in Damascus community. Um, I was invited so many times, most often, to talk shows in Arabic in Damascus to speak about behaviors and improving life and choosing the best for our kids, for our environment, anything to improve life. So I was, uh, I was really, I, I consider myself that I was a public figure, a positive public figure who always did whatever possible to change and improve life in Syria and the Arab world. Um, and when I say to change, it's very hard to change in a dictatorship where um, the habit is so powerful that you can't move. It's moving mountains is, looks, might look easier than changing a habit or a perspective towards women or girls or so many things. And uh, I was lucky enough to meet Fadia in 2006. And uh, we, I, I mean, we both discovered that we are almost on the same page in so many aspects in our lives. So we stuck together and we got married and Everything was great, despite the approval or this, the empathy from the regime. Because we did not do, we, did, we couldn't be um, the Instru propaganda instrument, or yeah. instruments for them, you know. So we were like the, f the, the, the free birds flying out of the herd. Or out. So, uh, but everything in our lives was nice 
was good and we were busy. Um, we did whatever we could. Um, so I will talk like a little bit. Yeah, I will talk a little bit as well about my life before the war and you feel free to interrupt me, ask me questions because this is what I like. I like questions. And you can as well write questions down and like pass it and we will answer and we will have Q and A after the talk. As Jay said, our life in Syria, uh, when you live under dictatorship, uh, the ceiling of dreams is very low. You don't have a lot of expectation, you don't demand a lot. The basic dream of everyone under the dictatorship to survive, to have food on the table, and to get as much as he can or she can from the situation he's living in. So a lot of people, they don't really think about changing things because they feel they are not really able to change fundamental or radical change. And they are right in a way. So uh, in my life, I, I was a rebel since my childhood and my family didn't like me much and my society unfortunately the same because I was demanding universal human rights. I was demanding to be equal. I demanded to study art. And my family said, no, you're not allowed to study art because you are a female. So they forced me to go to the law school after the high school. And my father told me, you are a good girl. You are smart. You have great grades. You have to go to the law school. It's very respectful to be a lawyer. So I went to the law school. I fell in love with it, honestly, because I discovered new things I didn't know. But at the same time, I went secretly and I studied art without telling my parents. So I double majored and I got a job. And this is very uncommon in Syria. I was working, studying at the law school and studying art. And I graduated from both schools. And then I invited my parents and my family to my first show. They were shocked because they didn't expect <laughs> something like that. And I was doing all of that without their approval and my mom was telling me after she saw like a bunch of journalists that are coming interviewing me it's okay it's a great hobby but remember you're a lawyer <laughs> so and i wanted really i was passionate at that time like, it's a great idea to be a lawyer to defend especially women because i came from a society where i know how much we are treated unequally and now I have a new tool to do some things. And I was shocked when I went uh, and I discovered the practical side of being a lawyer in Syria. It's a very corrupted system. We don't have separation in authority. Uh, uh, under, like we have one authority controlling everything. So we don't really have a free juridical system. Even the l judges, they will get a call from the president office and they would follow the orders. So there was no justice in my country. And if you are rich and you can bribe, no matter what kind of crime you are committing, you will not go to jail. And when I discovered that, I said, no, I cannot be part of this. It's impossible for me to, to be a lawyer. So I worked with the uh, Ministry of Culture for a while in many cultural events and exhibitions to organize for the artists. And I was all of this, and I have never thought in my life that a change would happen in my country. I have never dreamed that a revolution could happen and we could change the system. All my dream was, OK, the father, the old president died, and the son came, which is fantastic. He's westernized. He's educated. He promised to give us uh, freedom of speech. He promised to change the country, the economic close um, uh, system. It will be open. So I was very, very optimistic. And uh, that was my like ceiling. So, yes, great. Finally, we can do something. I can start my own nonprofit for women's rights. I can change blah, blah, blah. And then I was, again, hit. I hit my head into the wall when the secret police was hunting me because I was attending some forums. And they actually captured uh, uh, one of them, like icon yes. or leaders of the movement of change. And they put him in jail. And they interrogated every single part of the forum. 
I was shocked because I felt, okay, this is just a facade. Like everything happening in the country, we have glamorous new private bank we never dreamed of. We have a glamorous, beautiful restaurant and bars, but it's just the image. It's not true uh, permission to change. But even though at that time I never thought about revolution, again, because I am part of that society which is brainwashed not to have any option or even dream of revolution. And when I met Jay, I was very happy because he's a famous actor and I was using his fame <laughs> to my <laughs> own project. <laughs> so he was helping me in my project uh, to raise awareness toward women's rights, which is very hard in Syria because every time I would do an exhibition talking about women's rights, the secret police will come and interrogate me. And that guy, with his fame, he will come and talk to them and I'm out. So you, <laughs> and you can't find a man helping in women's rights. Um, it should be always a woman helping her. But true. when a man comes to help in women's rights and he ha is already credible by the audience, it makes shock or maybe difference. But even though I, that, that was my limitation, to talk a little bit about women's rights, to like uh, raise awareness, I created a, a short film about the women's issue. That was my limitation. When the revolution started in Syria, actually none of the young people started the revolution. It was started by a contagious wave coming from other Arab countries and the children in Syria were watching and then they decided to go to the street to imitate what they have been watching and they demand the, uh, uh, the dictator to go out and that, uh, that uh, to step down and that was the point when the revolution started because the secret police tortured these kids and that was the signal for every single one of us like we were shocked and we waked up and said, what is going on? And all the artists started to support the movement for freedom, for equality, and for accountability for those people who torture the kids. And from that point, the regime was very smart to use art and artists for his own propaganda. And he was unfortunately very successful for many reasons. One of the reasons they have all the power and artists are people at the end of the day and they have their family, they are scared for their status, they don't want to lose money, they don't want to lose fame. So it was a very tough choice for the artists either to support the dictator and save their status and maybe get some more benefits or to support those children who have been tortured and the revolution and they may be in danger. So Jay, he, he was one of the artists, so tell us about your experience, how they called you, what happened. They, they started calling me from the union, through the union, because when, so when, when we talk about Syria, don't... Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, very good point. Sure. So this was in 2011, March. April, March, April, because it started in March, and they, till we figured out that there were kids being tortured, like 10 days, uh, a week or 10 days, then when it sparked out and it spread it out to, home, to other cities. So it took like two weeks, so let's say March, April. So when, when we speak about Syria, please don't compare to any other country in the world unless you've been to North Korea or Iran, Iran, uh, Germany, Stasi, those governments. So the, 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 the actors, directors union in Syria, it's not like SAG-AFTRA in the United States or any other union in Europe. It's a police office to go after us, to report on us, and to take money. The percentage of the, maybe give some services at the end of the day. So they started calling us from the union. There is a march, pro-Assad march, 
pro-government. Uh, we are marching tomorrow, holding the president's uh, photos, pictures, and slogans, and everything, attacking, uh, defending our country, or patriotic uh, slogans against Qatar, Saudi Arabia, and Israel, and America. So I was, I am, I'm not a, uh, not, I don't want to say I'm not brave, because it's not bravery to stand against this regime, but I was scared, to be honest. And I was telling Fadi, they are calling me. She was always telling me, do not listen to them. You're not obligated. You are not for, don't listen, don't go. Who will know? Hundreds will go and you, you stay home. So I was always postponing because we can't say I'm not going. It's not an answer to them. So they kept calling me or whenever we meet in, on set or are you going tomorrow for the march, blah, 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 blah. Well, yeah, I'm, yeah, I don't think so, but with the filming, so I was always trying to maneuver. And I was always coming to her to asking for second opinion. Should we go go and be protected and maintain our lives, our status? I, I'm not convinced. I, I feel angry for those kids, for the people, for the... And she was always backing me up. Do not go, do not. They started calling me from the movie department, from the movies department, cinema department. We need to sign a petition against the people from that city who stood with their children. The opposing uh, petition. I said, well, I'm not down to sign anything. So those days, those weeks for me were, and I was filming, I was in really, uh, actually in two projects, very disturbing. I remember I, we, we, we both couldn't sleep well. Uh, we were disturbed by the, what we've seen in the streets, police, uh, f police uh, I mean, military, um, army people, uh, buses filled with arrested uh, young men and girls and women. And then they started arresting my friends who said, no, we are not doing that. And you better stop these arrests and these torture and these uh, military approach. And when they started arresting actors, actresses, painters, cartoonists, 74 years old cartoonist, very famous, and he disappeared, and he was tortured and thrown on the highway to the airport. All of this in 2012? All so this in one month. Like, it was, it was fast and furious just to capture all these public figures, those public figures, and torture them in a very quick two days, three days, and then release them to give the message because they have followers. They have all the, all, the, all the Syrian people follow them, following them. On the other hand, there are many of the artists, they decided to be the propaganda instrument for the regime, and they were producing songs, TV shows, movie, oh, going yeah. to interviews, yeah. supporting the military approach, supporting the president, and they were very successful actually in this. So they created they were pretending that, okay, look, all the artists are with us. So we are very secular, we are very good, and they were trying to give an image that this is the only good option for Syria because they pretend they are secular, all the artists, they are supporting them. They pretend to be very um, uh, progressive. Mm -hmm. They were pretending to give this fake image. And in part of it, they were very successful because many artists actually supported them either because they are afraid or they, need, they want the benefits out of this support. One of the producers called me one day, uh, Fadi was at, wor at her work, and he goes like, what do you have tomorrow? I said, I think I, I have filming, but I, I didn't have. He goes like, are you free between noon and 2 p.m.? I said, I can make myself free, Let, tell me. He was like, no, nothing. We, we need you for 10 minutes, up to 15 minutes. You just come to my office, 
production company. And we wear military. And then you will sing something for the president. I said, yeah, between two and noon and 2 p.m. Yeah, OK. Uh, let me see what happened. I'll, I'll let you know. So I didn't go. I figured out the next day that 15 of my friends, actors, were there, actresses and actors. And they needed only six. So they told the, the, the other people, the other actors, OK, we're good. Thank you. You can go home. No need. So six of them went, and they wore the army. And they sang for the army. They didn't sing for the country or for the people or for the patria. So while I was studying, I came to the US at the end of June 2011. And I was thinking, I was optimistic at that time. I was thinking one year, I will finish my studies, go back home. Definitely, we will have a new country. Definitely, we can start our democracy and we can participate in the society. But uh, after a while, I discovered, like, especially because I was looking from outside about what is happening inside, I discovered that it will take a really long time. So I asked Jay to send, to send me our account money in the bank to the US. So he went, we, so our, our money was with the government bank. And he went there, and he wanted to take our money and send it to the US. And they told him, no, you're not out allowed to take the money. You can take each month $1,000, because now we are in crisis, and we need the money. He said, but my wife, she's studying in the US, and she needs the money to pay rent. And so he said, in the record, no, your wife is not in the US. You have to bring a proof from the US embassy that she's studying Syrian in the embassy US. To Syrian Washington. embassy. And I contacted the Syrian embassy. I told them, could you, I, this is the proof. I am a student at the University of Minnesota. Could you please send me uh, a like, documentation or something like And they didn't get back to me. So I called the director of the program I'm studying with. I said, could you please contact them? And, and again, they never get me this paper. This is one of the way how to force you. Like, if you don't have the means, either you stand with them or you will suffer. So this is another way to force people to, to support them. They have many ways. They are so smart in using all their means because they are really controlling everything in the country. Uh, so he went to a certain the, point. Yeah. I I started. I I I have worked with uh, with a production company that was based uh, outside Syria. So I emailed them, uh, telling them, please don't transfer my payment to Damascus. I'll go to Lebanon, open an account because uh, they didn't want to send my money transfer my money to my wife because my wife's name is not on their record as a production company. So they, they, don't need, they didn't need complications. I said, I will go to Lebanon, open an account, and then get the money and then make the transfer. So I was going to Lebanon. And uh, I get an email from a lady uh, who was uh, an time reporter? Um, yeah, uh, moon reporter. Can it uh, uh, contractor? Contract. Uh, she had a contract, annual contract with the LA Times, saying, "Can you? Would you like to speak about the freedom of speech in the scripts in Syria?" About, I said yes. Uh, she she replies, "But can I am not in the Syria. I can't enter Syria. I am in Lebanon based. So can we?" Sky? I said, "No, no, no. I'm going to Lebanon tomorrow." So we meet in, in Beirut, outside Syria. After I finish with the bank, I go 5 p.m. I meet with the lady. And she goes like, she with a recorder, I would like to speak about the freedom of speech in the script. I said, of course, sure. So I started saying that we have a good freedom of speech, uh, better than any other country. And that's why the uh, entertainment business is flourishing in our country, in Syria. And uh, I want to tell you something 
the freedom of speech is only on scripts. What I want to mean, what I want to say, it's not on the streets. So you see something on the screen, but it's not applicable on the street. It's only an image. It's only um, some kind of uh, morphine. Like, look, we have democracy. Uh, we are open to, we listen to people. Uh, we change our decisions according to people's wish. But when it comes to reality, nothing of this happened. And I sh can I share this? I said, yes, of course, you can do. I'm like, oh, we were talking and talking. Then when we finished about the entertainment, she said, what is going on on the ground today? And she stops the recorder, and I start accusing the army, the security service, and the president in his name. Because you can speak about anything but not the president or the family. Uh, of torture, arrest, disappearance, and killing. And I say some of my friends, actors, and actresses are missing. Those are not fighters. Those are intellectuals. I have a judge who is missing. I have blah, blah, everything. But please, this is not in our interview. She said, no. The very next day, everything I say, with my full name, like this big, you can see it. Uh, LA Times, uh, Abdo, actor, uh, August uh, 13, 20, 2011. It's still there. And Fadia. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was here. Read the article. And here. I read the article, and they just I wrote the scenario in my head that this is the end. I am not going to see my husband again. I called him. I told him you have to leave now, and he was saying, No, no, it's in English. Who will read they it? They won't read it. <laughs> nah. He was like, when you are inside Arrogant Syria, man. but you, when you are inside here, you don't really see the big picture. You don't really, you feel like everything will be okay, and this is still the feeling for my family back home that everything will be OK. They are still waiting to things to get better. Then I um, called my director. I told her, you have to provide a visa for my husband. He has to come and join me. And it was very complicated because they closed the embassy in Damascus. And there is no way to get him a visa. Uh, then I don't know how. I called everyone I know. I told them, it's urgent. We got him a visa as soon as possible. He left Syria in the right time. And luckily, because it's not high-tech uh, country, you need usually you need a month to two to find your name in the borders. <laughs> so he left in the right time before his name, yeah. like distribute in the borders. So many people, our friends, so many friends of ours, were told, "You need you need to leave in in a week." Why? Because your name is on the list. What list? Arresting. You will be arrested. How do you know? Somebody told me, because he likes you. But I can't mention his name. You have to leave. So why, why, why a week? Because your name will be, at least in a week, at least will be on the border. So you can leave now, maybe 10 days, maybe a month. But a week is safe. So you have to leave in one week. But again, we discovered a new plan. The regime was really smart to plot. They forced every single actor, actresses, artists to leave if they are not supporting the regime. And the plan was very successful because everyone left Syria. So they painted an image for those people who left Syria as traders and as agents for those countries who they are like trying to, uh, according to the regime narrative, to destroy Syria. So again, you lose the credibility when you leave your country. So this is how they attack artists as well. No matter how much you're active and you live for your safety, they attack you by making you uncredible. And they were very successful in doing this. I received, when I, re re when I came to Minneapolis, I received on my social media so many threats. I was like, I'll delete it. I was like, do not delete it. This is the proof. 
that you are targeted. Do not, why are you deleting? I said, because I can't see them. Don't delete them. And the, the all, all anonymous, all anonymous, I didn't know who she was or, or he was, but w the, the threats were very scary, <laughs> very scary. So back to our journey, he came finally to the US and he was thinking, I'm just coming for two, three months. Oh, yeah. I'm, he was convinced like he will go back home. Oh, yeah. And I was waiting to explain for him like how complicated the situation is. It's not as easy as we wish. So it took him a little bit some time to understand that it's a long-term issue. Because I was thinking mm -hmm. it's a battle between people and government. I didn't know. But it's a proxy war. It's not like the, we can tell in Syria the first six months, it was purely people like, against government. After six months, totally the picture have changed. 2012, when you see the Iranian army in Syria, you see Hezbollah inside Syria. Hezbollah, Hezbollah which is the Iranian operated uh, party in Lebanon. Then in 2013, you see much more uh, countries get involved and they start to have their own troops in Syria. 2014, I think every single neighboring country, they were having their own armed group or whatever in Syria. In 2015, you see the actual Russian army in Syria. So it's not... Syrian war anymore. It's not as you see sometimes in the media civil war. It's no. not like this. It's actually a proxy war because every single government they have their own arm in Syria trying to take a piece of the cake and trying to control and have more influence. So after I, I finished my studies I wanted to stay either here or go to Washington DC or New York so I can find a job so we can survive Jay, in his case, he was saying, I'm an actor, I have to go to LA. The problem for us, we didn't know anyone to ask or to take an advice where to go, how to start a new life, what to do. Then we decided, okay, I will go with him to LA and hopefully he can find a job. And it was d impossible. We discovered the... Would you like to, sp to speak about the, pl the play we created here before? Oh, yeah, you can see. So Fadia came with an idea uh, uh, in her activism for Syria. Let's create a play. You are an actor. You play violin. Um, I, do, I can do a monologue, and I can talk to other artists, dance, yeah. artists to create a play of dances, music, poetry, pantomime, all these combined together to speak about the movement of the people in Syria. And we did it. I was afraid to death. I was scared to death to reveal my face. And I said, I'm not revealing my face because she said, we can't go back home. I said, I know, but I, we have families back home. So this was our, not fight, but this was argument. This was our, you know, debate, everyday debate. And you know, when you have an artistic project, you have to be enthusiastic. So you can give the best of yours, the best ever you can. But I was like one step ahead, two steps beyond. Because I was thinking of my parents and my brother who is in the orchestra. They will arrest him, they will torture them, they will, so, uh, then the director came with an idea why not using some masks. And she brought masks, but the masks were so bad. And I said, oh, this is so thick. And I, what the hell? I'm revealing my face. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> just because I didn't like the mask. OK. It was the, the show was tomorrow, and it's, what the hell? But it's a gradually like steps to lose your fear. Until now, we didn't lose our fear because we have no. family there. And it's, there are tons of stories happen to artists yeah. 
for example, Malik Jandali, if you read an article about him in New York Times, the he was pianist. yeah he was like performing uh, in Washington D.C. for the Syrian Revolution. Oh, he took his piano in front of the White House and he. <laughs> and after he did that, he had an argument with the Syrian ambassador at that time. So to punish him, they went after his parents in Syria. They were um, like over 75 years old. They beat them harshly. They locked them in the restroom and they left. So this is what they could do to your family. This is again something, as an artist, you cannot really be free, even if you live in a free country. But you are not 100% free. Every time, every single act, we do in this country, we go and we can't sleep because we think about what kind of things could happen to our beloved every ones. Every article, every interview, every, uh, especially in Arabic. And sometimes, sometimes after interviews in, in English with the, with the Wall Street Journal, with the, uh, the, Guardian. the Guardian, the Voice of uh, uh, London, the, um, Voice of America. Yeah, Voice of America, the Times of London. So after all those, uh, we were receiving some threats from Latin America, Syrians who live there, or because I received something in Spanish, but it was because I speak Spanish, I knew this guy or this woman speaking is not originally Spanish. Why would she threaten me? But again, uh, yeah, sorry. Maybe, oh, no, no. Yeah, the struggle for the artists actually did not uh, stay with just the Syrian regime. The problem started to be bigger when in 2014, 15, and until now, we had more than one enemy. We used to have just one enemy, the Syrian regime, and we started to have other enemy, the extremists. Yeah. And actually, ISIS sent many uh, of their fighters or their like, men to threat artists around the world. And they killed a filmmaker in Turkey after he created a, a movie. A documentary, about the relation very good documentary yeah. about how ISIS came from the governments of Iraq and Syria, their mm -hmm. beloved child. So they killed him. That was a shocking for the Syrian for, for the artist community because yeah. in this, Turkey. Yeah, this is again another another uh, every time very I harsh enemy we have to face and we have to think about yeah. about every time we we speak out we have to think about like where they look are located are we vulnerable in this place if we go to other country what will happen every time he has. Um, filming. filming in Turkey, I would be scared to death because I feel Turkey is not safe enough. And I know it's very accessible for ISIS fighters and they can go and kill any artist they speak against them. So this is the situation of the artist community around the world now, the Syrian artist community, because the majority of them who they are against the regime fled to France. So we called Paris now Little Damascus because every time we go there we see all our friends. Um, but it's still every time we talk to them, trying to encourage them to do some uh, artist project to speak about the situation, they are very discouraged because of the situation and the threats. Uh, our journey going to Los Angeles was very tough because Again, when you apply for asylum in this country, it's not easy process. It's very complicated, and you wait for years to get your approval if you are lucky. And in our case, Jay got his work permit. I did not. I spent a year and seven months without work permit. And in California, you cannot get driver license, no ID, and you are not exist. And you wonder how you will survive without work permit. How you will survive? Uh, to pay your rent and uh, it was a real struggle uh, knowing no one trying to find a, a house uh, trying to find a, an apartment to live in and trying to find a job eventually I think we are one of the luck luckiest refugees in on the earth because we are we, we survived and we we work right now and we are in a good situation but I think this is very few percentage of the refugees and the artists around 
who they are like uh, staying around the, the world in many different countries. Uh, I just want to speak like this is not something just happening in Syria. I think the community of artists, they are facing exactly the same thing in, in, in many similar situations. Like when I read about the Holocaust and how Hitler was using art to create the propaganda, I just find the same situation happening right now in Syria and they are using the Iran same today. things. Uh, it's just shocking how uh, when you talk about art, you think about positive things, but in reality, it has two sides. So it's not enough just to have the talent. It's not enough as an artist just to have the, uh, to master the craft. It's more than that. It's about critical thinking. It's about staying and understand justice and stay with the, with the right side. And this is why I think uh, in Syria, they were very, very smart, the Syrian regime for 40 years uh, was targeting education, was targeting uh, critical. critical thinking. Yeah. Um, you can be a great doctor in Syria, you can be a great engineer, and maybe a lawyer, but to certain limit, you don't have enough space to have any education about any real artistic radical things. You cannot question anything, so you don't, you, we, we are a generation without questions. This is how I call it. Like, we don't question things, we just follow. Just to mention, uh, apropos, when I came to America, any question anybody would ask me, I would think, why is he asking? What is he aiming for? What is his agenda? No, it's a, it's a simple question. You answer it, or you don't, or you fake it, or say the truth i mean don't it's not personal it's not interrogation it's not interrogative but because we lived under fear from questioning it stayed with us it's in our dna for 50 years we've been living with this fear i'm talking about somebody who was who used to live very well who was friend I, I remember somebody stopped me in the street and he said, would you like to say I am general, colonel, somebody in the, uh, in Army. our, the, no, no, in the, in the palace. Oh, okay. So I am in the office of the president and this is my business card. Whenever you need anything, anything, you are untouchable. We love you. Would you like to say hi to my kids in the car and maybe, and my wife is there? I said, of course. I, I've never called him, but I, I felt I was kind of protected. But now when I think of the others who, and, as, and yet I was living with that fear. So how the others were doing, how they were, because they were isolated, um, no connection. If you don't know anybody, you are no one, unprotected, very vulnerable. You can't do anything. You can't. If you do any mistake, it's the end of the world. So, yet I, I was. All, whenever I was asked a question, I was like, huh? But not anymore because now we know. We know. But what the difference is between that regime and being in a outside Syria, let's say. Yeah. Would love to hear your questions. We spoke a lot. Because I think <laughs> we spoke a lot, but we have a lot. Still to talk about that. I'd love to hear your question. Yeah. Sorry. Take this Never question. Never demo. Yeah. Uh, my name is Gonda. I'm from Albania, actually. And thank you very much. Where from? Albania. Albania. Okay. Uh, I'm listening to you, and it's like I'm listening to the story of my country. Yeah. Uh, for 50 years, we have been in under the leadership of communist regime that isolated not only uh, artists, but everyone that was living there. And was more severe, I guess, than your regime, because we, we couldn't have relationship or connection with, with the outside world that was outside our boundaries or our borders. Um, when I was a little child, I was actually living in the dictatorship here till I was six years old, seven years old. I was lucky. But my father and my mother, our family was persecuted. And I remember uh, saying to myself, that, oh my God, if I would be in another place, but I don't know what other place I was talking about. I just had this dream. Anyway, I grew up and when I was maybe a teenager, I thought, why America didn't do nothing about our country? But they left us for, for 50 years. And 
had this horrible regime. People were killed because they were smart. They were intelligent. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Artists were killed, yes. killed were persecuted, were persecuted, everything that you yes. can imagine, tortured. And uh, now that I'm an, I'm an advocate for human rights, I work for children with disabilities, for rights of women. Good for you. In, uh, in Albania and uh, in Europe. I'm thinking that, uh, okay, in the international community has a type of responsibility for our uh, countries that are built in a dictatorship uh, system and we are brainwashed, we are not allowed to have critical thinking and maybe we cannot take initiative for our country sometimes. We are not powerful enough even though we can be educated, etc. How uh, much responsibility would you give now to the international community for Syria? Because it's not only Assad in Syria, mm -hmm. it's Turkey, it's Russia, it's this and it's that. Everyone is claiming a piece. This is a very good question because, again, it's, uh, we, when we think about the UN and we think, okay, the UN, they have the Security Council and they discuss those kind of issues about each country, they discuss every time, every time, like, I, can, I, don't, I lost count of the yeah. sessions they are having for Syria. But again, the problem with the UN as a system, in my eyes, I think, they don't have mechanism a real mechanism really to, to apply or to implement their decisions. They still, with a veto system, I feel we are still like going to the same point. It's a, it's a vicious, vicious cycle. We are not really doing any progress because we have the veto. Every time one of the powerful countries vetoed any decision happening in the Security Council, it will block it and there is no movement. And it's always like this. The whole world, they have two powerful countries. Both of those countries, eventually they are fighting and people are the actually actual victims. And um, there is a, I love there is an African proverb talking, the elephants fight and the grass dies. And this is very true. <laughs> I love that because this is what's happening right now. So to speak about it because the UN, in my eyes, they have really, they are limited because the si their system is just not the ideal system we should have in this earth. This is actually our problem. The problem is we should, as people, hold those biggest countries accountable because eventually Russia and the US those are the most powerful countries so far. They are responsible for every single genocide happening in this earth. And they claim they are not intervening. And they claim it's not their own dirty hands. But reality is not like this. Reality, like if we have investigation for every single act against humanity, powerful countries are behind it. And they convince their population that, no, it's not their fault, and they are not really responsible. It's a game. But again, how we are as an activist, we can prove that. How we can do it. Do we have enough power to do it? And the question, unfortunately, I discovered that late, lately, that we are so tiny and we are not powerful enough. I, every single um, production of art I do to reveal the truth does not really reach out enough people to create a movement and to push the public opinion. Because now we have a corporations, a big media corporation, they control every single thing and they get to, in to every single individual home. And they are owning the narrative. And because they are owning the narrative, we cannot really reveal the truth about what is happening. So again, it's a very big game. It's bigger than us as individuals. But I, uh, I, I, I think we should not give up. We should find it. Probably there is a technique, especially as an artist. I feel I am responsible, and I am still searching to find this medium to reach as much people as we can in order to create public opinion and to push the government and to force the government, the powerful government, to do something good for the common good. 
Again, there is a, another narrative. Uh, a lot of powerful countries, they convince their own people that we are good and those far countries does not affect us. And I th don't think this is true because everything is connected and everything happening, any act of terror, <laughs> terror for example, happening is a result of something so horrible happened one day, probably 40, 20 years ago. Everything is very connected again. And this is, again, very big question. I don't know what to do. Honestly, I am like, I, I know now there is no country called Syria anymore. I lost my country. I know like millions of Syrian are suffering. I can't really do much. But a lot of people tell me, okay, why you are still speaking? I said, because I have to raise awareness. Hopefully people will learn. Hopefully we can stop the second war coming because I know after some years, another country will face the same thing. Another genocide will happen. Another destruction will happen. So this is why we should not give up. No matter how much we, lo we lose, no matter how much we, we can't fight those big dinosaurs, we should not die silent. We should just keep talking about, him, about it, find a solution to reach out to as much people as we can. Yes, we have a question. Out of fire. Out of fire. May 1st, 2012. <laughs> Yes. Uh, in fact, uh, um, while I was listening to uh, all uh, your talk, and it was, of course, very informative, uh, because I've been closely following the Syrian war uh, in the international media as well as in the local media. But I somehow or the other did miss or there wasn't anything about the plight of the artists there. And uh, as you said, uh, just uh, a question to my brother, please, uh, that Probably if there is a joint platform for all the artists who are out of the Syria to present their case and to showcase the plight of the general people, of course, who are still in Syria, uh, any joint platform is there or you could think of doing that. And that would be of great help for, uh, because as an artist, of course, your voice does matter and matters more than uh, an ordinary person. Uh, last year, we, um, we, uh, I was, uh, we filmed a movie, short film. It was a Swiss movie called Bon Voyage, and it spoke about the refugee crisis. And we got 14 awards for best movie with this, and it was shortlisted for the Oscars. We didn't make it to the five, but this year we made another movie, a different cast and crew, and we are shortlisted for the Oscars, and we will figure it out tomorrow morning at 7.22 p.m. a.m. if we go with the five or no. So uh, we are trying to create films about this issue. And inside these movies, there are hidden messages about the reason be be behind becoming refugee. And I think films are a very powerful tool to send messages. Uh, we are in contact, all Syrian uh, artists, either the entertainment business in France or the musicians in Berlin. By the way, there is a Syrian orchestra in Berlin for classical music of 60 or 78 musicians. And we are all in contact to create uh, artistic work uh, to express our, to s well, to send the message to, to the world. A different message to the world, a different message from the media. Uh, that sometimes it's frustrating. It's not real. It's not enough. Uh, this is what I think. Yeah. So again, artist is a human being. He has basic needs. And again, 
you, you will find yourself a refugee like any other refugee with no money, no networking. You have to learn the language. You have, you have all those struggles to build your life. So you have individual suffering. You have to build your life. So you don't have really enough time, resources to do any uh, projects for your art and for your message. So again, the, um, all the artist community, they are still struggling to find their way to sustain their, 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 their selves and their life and yeah. rebuild their life. Like me and Jay, we are still struggling right now to find financial stability. We are still, because every single of us, we has a family back home and we have also to support our families. So it's not something easy actually to create artistic things. The other thing, no one is interested to fund those kind of projects. And this is very important things because at the end of the day, no much how much creative artist you are, if the subject who you're talking about is not interesting for them and they serve their own interest, they don't support you. Again, it's a question of funding. Probably uh, there are in many action movies in Hollywood now, they ask us like, could you help us? We need to create ISIS movie. Why? They need action movie. So they put ISIS there. They don't really want to speak about the root of ISIS. They don't want to speak about, they just want the action out of it. And that does not serve the message. That does create horrible images about Syria in my eyes. Does not really explain what is going on. And again, it's a, question of money, question of stability for us as an artist to be able to create our own project. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. You're amazing. So this is again something you don't understand from the U.S. immigration and homeland security. Um, I don't know if they have like a regulation to follow or this is happening by chance or it is just bureaucracy. Or I don't know because every single case is different and it depends how lucky you are. In our case, I don't know if they are uh, intentionally giving him work permit and not giving me work permit but I, the only thing I know they make it harder for you to live in this country it's just to pushing you to leave the country I think in our case like in his he's very uh, young in spirit but <laughs> for his age it was so hard to find a job and uh, he's he sorry to talk about in behalf of you but he's an actor and he does not have really um, any other skills to be able to find a job in Los Angeles. And no one wants to hire someone who's over 50. Uh, I called, so I, I, I am a lawyer, so I, have, I called the U.S. Immigration Service every single day. And they prohibit me You just to tell them, <laughs> Fadia, Fasha, and they will say, what do you want? <laughs> so I, it's my right. So I... I was following up and trying to force them to issue a work permit for me. Then I accused them, says, is it because I am a woman? So you, are, you don't want me to work? What is going on? I was trying to use every single angle I can to force them to give me work permit. And every time they will give me, we send it to you by mail. Said, how comes he get it? I did not get it. We are on the same Okay, case. now we register your application and your, uh, your phone call. Everything is okay. You cannot call again until 30 days I, um, yes sometimes 30 sometimes 60 days and yeah. you have to wait this period of time and after that if you didn't get it you can call again and file a case again so this is their way this is the regulation and the bureaucracy in this country you never know exactly what's going on what's and we are but still we are the lucky ones because after waiting for a year and a half we got an interview and after I don't know how many months, then we got approval. And after waiting two years almost, I was having work permit. And they give you temporary work permit. So every time I would go to interview, they will, okay, you're hired, give me your work permit. They look at it, they said, okay, we will call you because 
they don't want to take the chance and hire you and then your work permit will expire. So they don't want those complications. So again, if you don't, there are many ways like just to intimidate you and push you out of this country. And it was very tough, like until we got our green card, it was impossible for us to get, to get good jobs. Because we got green card, finally, we were able to find much better jobs. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. A very good question. So activists inside the country are penalized. They can't do anything. They can't do anything. The minute they, the minute they feel, the government feels or smells that they are planning to do something, they will be arrested. If not, they will go after their families, after their bank accounts, they will hit them in the street, you name it. But outside Syria, it's way much easier. But so many of my friends, actors, couldn't, or painters, couldn't do anything in the Gulf, in Jordan, or in those countries because they don't want troubles. They don't want the um, epidemia of revolution to be, their people to be infected with this, you know, because the, Syrian, the Syrians dared to stand up and fight for their rights, but they, we don't want our people to, to do it. So please, no activism, no uh, march, no protests, no slogans, nothing. All the Gulf, Saudi Arabia, anything. If you do anything, if, if you speak up, you are deported immediately. You can't even speak up. Now in Europe, it's different. In Europe, every day, our friends march, they paint, they do everything they can to spread the word and to express it, and they are protected by police, of course. On the other hand, the other side of the, you know, the, the pro-government, people are sent every day from Syria to all, everywhere in the world, to sing, to dance, and to send the government message. Would you like to, please? Yeah, but you said about something, t technique they use very well uh, to, uh, to make those activists lose their credibility. They work very well in this, especially if you are outside of the country. It's very easy to really paint the wrong image for you. But they do that even for people inside the country. Like when I was in the country, the easiest way to make me lose credit, like you have a great life and you are still talking about it. Like you, you, they find a way to make you, in the eyes of the people, you are not from them. It's always they find, they are so smart about finding, and people are already banaroid. It's, it's very easy to really uh, divide and conquer in those countries. And this is why it's so hard for activism. So I think uh, activism outside of the country for not the people of the country, for other people is much more efficient because people in a country like the U.S., they have a voice. 
and their voice is very important and they can utilize their voice and mm -hmm. they can call their congressmen and women and they can push their government to do something meaningful. So I think inside the country, uh, people have no power and no matter how much you try to push them to do something, it's very hard <laughs> because that domination is so big and the powerful uh, regime is stronger than anything really to ask people to do anything. They just want food on their table and they <coughs> hardly, hardly can have food on their table. So I think now the act real activism to ask for other people in a democratic country to, to help people in need inside those countries where they suffer dictators. There's a story about a very dear friend and actress in Syria, inside Syria, because you asked, who didn't do anything wrong. And she's a very sweet heart. I worked with her several times. Her name is Samar Kokash. This girl was going somewhere outside Damascus to do voiceover in a company. On her way back, she sees, she spots some people under the trees, sleeping, families, children, women, and she decides to buy for $100 just bread and take it there. Spread bread, nothing. So she does it, and while there, she sees a girl with a infected eye. I don't remember why. The eye was bad. And she, she asks the girl, what's happened to your eyes? And the girl doesn't respond. Her mother, well, well good. Just leave us. Thank you for the bread. You go back home. No, I'm taking her to the capital, to Damascus for treatment. You better not, the mother says. No, I'm taking her. So she takes the girl with her in the car. The first checkpoint, they arrest both of them. They send the girl walking to the refugee tree or something. And my friend is still in prison for five years. What is the accusation? Helping uh, terrorism. Samar, the girl helping or supporting terrorism. That was her sentence, accusation for five years in prison. So this is not an activism. This is a help, what she what Fadia said at the beginning. So she didn't dare to do any artistic, which is more powerful. Right? So. More yeah. questions? We'd love to hear more questions. Yes, please. Um, specific on your artistic voice, how has it changed um, since you've moved here? What was it like before you moved, and what boundaries did you draw for yourself? Or Yeah. yeah, good. Very good question because definitely under dictatorship, everything is hidden, everything is indirect. Like, we were not able really to talk directly about changing the laws or the lack of women's rights. I used to have an exhibition with uh, hidden messages, never dare even to title sometimes my paintings. Like, I always just keep. Uh, this information according to the people who's coming and watching in the exhibition and then maybe we will have an open conversation maybe not depends how much I could trust the other person but that was this is why I was feeling helpless because I didn't feel like I'm really changing anything and this is why I decided I wanted to create a movie because I know Syrian people they are like 24 hours watching TV. Uh, this is the only entertainment, actually. They, they watch just TV. We don't have open libraries. We don't have open parks. We don't have open places to go to. The only thing, actually, Source. they are watching TV. So I, th I was thinking, OK, people are crazy about actors. They love them so much. So I asked my help, the help of my husband, who, you know, all those stars could you ask them to work for free for this movie so maybe we can because when whenever you have big stars with you so i was thinking it's easy to 
send the movie to the uh, national TV and they will present it and that was my idea to really reach out to people and it took me a year to get permission to shoot the movie because it's to talk about women's issues and I was thinking okay the first lady she's claiming she's supporting women's rights so I sent her all the materials and was asking for help to help me and she promised yeah I will help and it took me a year to have the permission and after I finished the movie I send it and I was thinking, okay, maybe now I will get the help to show the movie in the Syrian channel and I never heard back and I was not able to show the movie. So again, there was like a lot of limitation to talk about certain things, especially if you, like, you didn't stick to the red, li li uh, red lines or something like that. However, here, I feel like everything has changed. The, the level of freedom I am enjoying now is just unspeakable for me. It's just easier. Like sometimes I will tell Jay, I prefer to speak in English about those topics because I feel it's con I learned those things in English. So for, it's very weird how language connect to feelings. Uh, I don't feel comfortable talking about it sometimes in Arabic, which is very weird, but this is my feeling. It's, uh, the fear is still inside me. I still talk about things and sometimes think about many things could happen because I'm talking about these issues. But again, now, um, after I had three exhibitions in Los Angeles uh, about the Syrian issues, I was painting every single person I know personally. Uh, I painted a, a, a painting about him or her, and I talked to people about those people I know in Syria and their suffering and their stories. But again, after a while, I felt I'm reaching out to very few people. They are already open-minded people. They are already interested in international issues. I didn't feel I'm creating real change. So again, I am in the same dilemma, the same feeling I used to feel back home. I don't know, like, I should find another medium to really reach out to much more people I want to. But definitely the level of freedom I cannot compare. I cannot compare like how much freedom I feel now to talk about any issues. Even when we speak, when sometimes have, we have interview in Arabic, like the other Sunday I, we were interviewed for an Arabic channel, Arab channel, and uh, the woman who was interviewing us, the girl, was like, with the f level of, you know, of freedom ex of expression or the easiness we were tackling all those subjects and the different way of speaking about them between Syria and outside. So it was super... Yeah. But every time I was talking, she was like, sorry, we cannot present that. Probably we'll edit that. <laughs> <laughs> Because they have, yeah, they have limitation and they are so scared because if they, again, they, they have red lines and any minute they are because touching the red lines, yeah. they are in danger. So again, it's not satisfying in the Arab world. Until now, there is no one uh, media uh, in, like could be really free. All the media uh, instruments, they are under control and uh, yeah. have red lines. And something I just remember now about um, restricting artists in the Arab world, the, those who spoke. Um, after I landed this leading role opposite Nicole Kidman in 2014, I was issued a travel document to go to Morocco for filming, for filming. The Moroccan embassy didn't issue me the visa. Why? Because I am a travel document holder. So I'm a refugee. So I fled my country. That means that I spoke up against my president. We don't need you here. So it was almost impossible for me to get the visa. It wasn't written on the, on the website. It's all under the table, hidden top. 
No, no need for those people. No need. Anybody who speaks up, let him stay up. I, at the beginning, I said, "Are they are they afraid that I will I will flee America to live in Morocco?" <laughs> no, no. Afterwards, I figured out that they don't want people in Morocco or any other country to speak up against their president or against their regimes. And again, this is a legal issue because none of those Arab countries, they are part of the International yeah. Refugee Convention. Yes. And when you are not part of this convention, you don't recognize the refugees. Yeah. So this is why they don't consider our travel document a travel document. Mm -hmm. yeah. More questions, please? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> what is uh, happening with the students and other professionals in Syria? Because it's expected that more, most educated or intelligent people will still, uh, those are the ones who will push the bigger movement. Yeah. What are they doing currently? I know it's hard. I know it's, they say, threatening with their lives. Uh, I, can, I can just imagine the situation. But I'm sure there are people that are courageous enough very good question. Yeah, it's very good question about the universities and and those like why our regime they have intense security, uh, what they call it, security um, guys in the universities, security like yeah, because they know young people usually they are very passionate. Young people they need their own rights. They demand and they ask for. So they know. 100% like they should control universities because this way yeah. they will prevent any movement. Yeah. So unfortunately, uh, those like all kind of those regimes, the dictatorship, they intervene, intervene the society in a way that you could find one on three people, <laughs> they are part of the secret police. Um, it's not by choice, I think, but this is the system and this is how people survive. The first thing they targeted the teachers because they are teachers are really yeah. the, the mind of the country so they target them if the teacher they are not 100 percent loyal to the regime they cannot teach at all and they have many tests and they have many people are watching their steps mm -hmm. and words one by one and they know they are under su oh, uh, surveillance oh, so they either they have to be very careful or they have to be loyal and period. The other thing in the universities now, more than 90% females. Males, either they escape the country because they are um, trying to escape the military service, or they are in a prison. Uh, we don't know the or exact- killed. Or killed. So we don't know the exact number of people in prison like according to many international reports we have over than uh, 20 50 uh, thousand people yeah uh, a quarter million quarter million they are in the prison but this is not the real number no this is not the real number because we have uh, the reported missing people um, uh, over than that so i think all those missing people are in prison. Yeah. Um, so you go to the universities you, and you find just girls and you find uh, uh, the all the teachers they are speaking every single lecture no matter what kind of lecture they are talking about to support the president and the army <laughs> even they, if they have uh, uh, engineering classes they should start with supporting the president and the army so they don't have choices anymore. Yeah, thank you for the question. This is a very good question to give an idea what kind of country now Syrian people they are facing. Maybe it's easy for me to make a question because you come from a very small and maybe it was, the reading was more to hear uh -huh. our case, but without having the international interviewing or training outside yeah. Russia yeah. or outside Turkey yeah. or whatever. Yeah. We had this situation actually for 50 years, many people have tried to make the revolution in yeah. our country. It was very difficult and intellectual. Mm -hmm. uh, they were killed, they were not allowed to go anywhere. They were persecuted in specific areas and isolated. 
like the fact yeah. that it's under the sea. Yeah. So it's easy for me to make this question because the students you know. and professionals uh, brought the freedom for us. Yeah, yeah. But I yeah. guess it's not, yeah. not that, that easy when others are yeah. True. Again, our problem in Syria because w w our regime was so smart. When you read the constitution, and we, when you look at the, what kind of ruling they are having, they are so smart to use mix. Uh, they, they they are not communists, and they are so smart about it. They are not one hundred percent communist, but they are actually following all the steps of communists without admitting that. At the same time, they are not 100% capitalist, and they are... They are not 100% anything. Yes. They yeah. know they color. Cre they created a very unique no shape. system, very unique system that give them the privilege to have a great image, and yeah. at the same time a great uh, iron, ru ru like iron hand to rule, iron, every fist. iron fist to rule the country. They were very smart to do that. Yeah. yeah. I want to honor the time. It's 5.30 yes. now, and I um, just want to say thank you for thank you. speaking to us and for the conversation. It's really been very, very meaningful. So thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for thank being you. here. Thank you. Thank you for coming today. Thank you so much for everything. Thank you.